All right. So first things first, as always, I want to open it up to questions from you guys. Um, so having read or gone over or listened to this first chapter um, of Lewis's The Abolition of Man, overall thoughts, general ideas or questions for clarification, anything like that, what do you guys have? What did you think of what he had to say or how he had to say it? Anything in here that you weren't sure what he was talking about as well, anything like that? Yeah. It wasn't too convoluted. Right, and, and I'll say a lot of that is style, right? C.S. Lewis um, is probably better known as a fiction author, right? You guys have probably all either at least heard of and probably read some of The Chronicles of Narnia, his probably most well-known books. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that he was also um, really prolific in nonfiction. He wrote a lot of philosophy, he wrote uh, some theology, he wrote a lot of literary history um, because he was, a, he was a, an English scholar. He wrote some things like education theory and all kinds of stuff. You'll notice he talks about education quite a bit in this book, right? especially in the first chapter and what we just read. Um, and his style of writing, even the most complex stuff that he writes, is very conversational and really straightforward. It really helps in understanding at least if that's your style, right? which it isn't for everybody, to be fair. Um, in fact, this, was, this whole book was given as a series of radio addresses to the general public in uh, 1941, maybe four? 1940, early 40s, let's go with that. Um, I know the book version was published in 1944. That I know. Um, so basically, these were given as a uh, series of radio addresses to the British public during World War II. Hence, the, uh, the, the few allusions that we're getting so far to, uh, to Nazism that will come up more in the later chapters as well. Because that's sort of on the public's mind when he's writing and delivering these talks. But he gave these as just sort of discussions, talking to people. And so it comes off as very conversational. Um, because of that, there's something that you may notice structurally. Um, which is a stark difference from some of the stuff we're going to be reading later on. Um, when we read um, McInerney, Ethica Thomistica, um, that is much more um, analytical and straightforward, almost formulaic. Um, that isn't to say he doesn't write well, um, because he, it's still more so at the beginning, and then it gradually builds to more complexity, but it, it's still relatively straightforward in, his terms of, in terms of his phrasing and that sort of thing. He gradually builds in technical terms and things like that, but it's much more straightforward than something Lewis would write. Right? So what Lewis does here throughout not just this chapter but through this whole book is he takes uh, what's usually called a hermeneutic method. Has anyone heard of this? Familiar at all to anybody? No? Okay, so the hermeneutic method uh, comes from a method of uh, biblical interpretation the uh, sort of late 19th century, if I remember right, um, which again, outside my area of historical expertise. But the idea is that if you read through a text, and this can apply to any form of text, right? This expands beyond simple biblical interpretation into any writing or any discussion of a topic, that the first time you read or discuss something, you'll get certain information out of it. You'll understand some of it. But then, the second time through, you will understand more of it because now you are reading, discussing, listening to, or watching it, or whatever, in the context of already having known everything that you've already gone through, right? So you've learned everything there is to learn at a surface level. You've integrated that into your mind. Then you read the thing again, and you get a new layer of information because now you, you know what the whole thing is about, so you can read it in the context of itself. And then, the more complex a text is, or the more complex a question is, the more times you can do this loop. You can keep going through and digging through in this sort of concentric spirals. So Lewis writes like this. Right, so he'll start off with a topic, right? He'll meander through, talking about some other things, some various other topics, and then you will find that he comes back to the original topic. And then he basically does the same thing 
and then he does the same thing. And that's the end of the first chapter. And then he does, it, does more spirals in the second chapter and then into the third chapter. Right? So essentially what Lewis is trying to do here is he's trying to cover the same ground multiple times in light of having already discussed the same topics so that we can get a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper each time. The plus side of this is that it's very conversational, it's very easy to follow. The downside to this is it's not always quite so clear where we are in the discussion because he meanders through it quite a bit, right? Yeah, you might be discussing this point for the second or third or fourth time, and you might kind of know where things are going here, but if you want to know about, say, this topic that he talks about two or three times, it's hard to find exactly where he talks about it because it's in two or three different places, right? So organizationally, it's a little rough. But as far as just sort of explaining it to you in a conversational manner, very simple, very straightforward, and it works. Great examples of this are, um, like, if you've watched a movie that has a major twist and then watched it again. Any examples you can think of? I'd rather use your examples than mine, because mine are probably outdated. OK, how so? Yeah, right, so Hans is, as best you can say, more or less the villain of Frozen, right? Um, and so if you watch it through the first time, you don't see it, right? You might, but you know, if you're target audience, if you're, if you're 12, right, you don't see it. But then, the second time through, now knowing that he's the villain from the start, you see the signs and you see how things match up and what his plans might have been all along, that sort of thing, right? Um, my favorite example of this is uh, Christopher Nolan's film, Memento. Have anyone seen it? Memento? It's a good movie. It's basically about a guy who has short-term memory loss and is trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Like, what is he supposed to be doing? What was he trying to do? And so throughout the film, which is told out of order because his experience is sort of out of order, he's doing things like writing himself notes, tattooing things on himself, trying to get himself to figure out what he was supposed to be doing without a complete picture of what's going on. And finally, the end of the movie is the inciting incident that started the whole process. Because then he eventually, he eventually figures out exactly why he was doing all of this. And that ending revelation is actually the beginning of the story. And so the second time through, Realizing why he was doing all of this completely changes the context for everything that happens. So again, I, I, I highly recommend it. It's a good movie. Uh, go watch it twice um, because, of, because of this point. Um, but beyond that, there are some things and topics, more so than texts, that are sufficiently complicated that talking about them enough times over and over and over won't exhaust the subject matter. So you can continuously talk about something and then come back to it, now having the context of something else, having the context of having, this, having had this whole discussion already, then you're then able to sort of dig deeper into it. And that's kind of Lewis's method, especially in this text, but he does this a lot. All right. Anything else about this, whether that's stylistic or Content-wise, anything you weren't sure of, anything I should clarify. Did anybody watch the illustrated audiobook version of it? No? Okay. I find it to be particularly useful. I cobbled this together. Basically, this, this is the image of the whole thing. Um, I managed to sort of stitch that together sometime years ago. Um, because it is a, uh, I find this kind of illustration to be really helpful to sort of keep track of where you are, especially in something that's a bit meandering like this. Um, and so if you want to review it, I would recommend the, uh, the, the Doodle Illustrated Audiobook version. Check it out. Um, but that aside, if you had to, and this is very difficult, again, given the structure, but if you had to simplify down 
what Lewis is trying to say in this first chapter. What is his major point, or maybe what are some of his major points? What's he trying to get at here? Right, so the major point of his first chapter, at least a major point of his first chapter, is about early education. Right? So th this green book that he's talking about by Gaius and Titius, this, um, uh, this basically English textbook, uh, for he says the upper books of school, so think middle school. Right? Um, so this is like a sixth, seventh grade English textbook. The problem that Lewis is pointing out is twofold. One, first and foremost, that what the authors of this book are doing is not teaching English. What they're doing is subtly, and maybe not even deliberately, smuggling in philosophical concepts under the guise of teaching English. Right. And so if you'll recall, this is where he talks about, well, you would find yourself quite upset if you sent your child to the dentist and he came back with his teeth untouched, um, but his head crammed full with the dentist's overture dicta on bimetallism and the Baconian theory were the examples, right? By the way, anyone know what those are, what that means? Bimetallism or Baconian theory? One of these I knew about, one of these I had to look up. So bimetallism is uh, the economic theory having to do with two competing currencies in circulation uh, and the various issues that that might give rise to. So, right, so using gold coinage and silver coinage and like varying exchange rates, right? This is a, a real a current problem like within the last 20 years or so in the UK because of the, uh, the competing currencies and the exchange rates between the pound and the euro, both of which are used in the UK. So somehow this is somewhat, somewhat relevant. Um, and then the Baconian theory is the idea that William Shakespeare didn't exist, but was really a pen name for Sir Francis Bacon. There is serious evidence for this. It is a vanishingly small minority view, but it keeps, but the scholars who do kind of believe it keep bringing up problems that other scholars have to solve. So it's, it's on the weird line of crazy academic conspiracy theory, but with enough evidence to be compelling. But it's not what you'd go to the dentist for, right? Similarly, the ideas that Gaius and Titius are putting forward here are not what you'd go to an English class for. At least if you were aware of what those ideas were and the context they were being put forward in. That's Lewis's first major point. The second major point of criticism that he makes is what those ideas actually are. The ideas that Gaius and Titius at all, because this is sort of representative of a lot of, uh, of modern education even today, 80 years later, the ideas actually being put forward, he winds up criticizing as well as being rather dangerous and certainly incorrect. Now later on, in mostly in, okay, so structure of the book. First chapter, here are what the problems are. Sort of lays out what these issues are. The second chapter is what he dedicates to pointing out the actual errors in uh, this view, referred to as either subjectivism or emotivism. Emotivism is what this sort of comes to be called, this view that he's criticizing. So the second chapter, The Way, is all about criticizing this view, showing it to be mistaken, showing the errors of this view called emotivism. The third chapter is looking at how this came to be. Was this out of ignorance or was it out of malice? Were people, like educators like Gaius and Titius, were they sort of taken in by these ideas and are just sort of carrying them on? Or were they deliberately miseducating people, children in this case, for their own perhaps nefarious purposes? And he speculates about both. He talks about why it might be one or the other, and we'll get there next week. The first chapter is simply laying out what the problems are. Why is it a problem, first of all, that English teachers are trying to teach philosophy, 
of their own particular very, very specific sort. And what is that philosophy that they're trying to teach? Okay. So um, let's look at the first example that he gives. This is the, uh, the waterfall one. Remember this? So if you remember, he says that Gaius and Titius points to a particular example from, I think it's Wordsworth. I think it's Wordsworth. So there are two tourists present at the waterfall. One called it sublime and the other pretty. And that Coleridge, the, the observer here, mentally endorsed the first judgment and rejected the second with disgust. Guys and Tish's comment as follows, quote, when the man said, this is sublime, okay. he appeared to be making a remark about the waterfall. Actually, he was not making a remark about the waterfall, but a remark about his own feelings. What he was saying was really, I have feelings associated in my mind with the word sublime, or shortly, I have sublime feelings. Okay. This is a perfect summary of the view that Lewis is arguing that these educators are smuggling into English class. What is it? What is this emotivist perspective? What is he getting at here as, uh, as a problematic view, as a view that we should ultimately, he thinks, reject? What's, what's going on here? Okay. If you like look at that, it's like, oh, that, that chair is pretty. Oh, so you're saying that you have specific feelings about a chair when you don't. Right. So the view here is that statements of value, particularly in this case, aesthetic judgments, right? Judgments about beauty, about uh, about um, fittingness, about sublimity, right? Aesthetic judgments primarily, but again, it winds up being not exclusively. But that these are statements about oneself rather than statements about the thing that they're attempting to describe. So to use your example, if you were to say, that's a pretty chair, the assumption of this view is that you don't mean what you're saying, right? If I say, hey, that's a pretty chair, what that seems to mean, if we're just taking the words as meaning what the words mean, is that I'm talking about that chair and I'm attributing it a particular quality, an aesthetic quality, that it's pretty. Rather, this emotivist view, the view of Gaius and Titius, would say rather that what I really mean to say when I say that chair is pretty is that I like it and that's it. That's all it means. The result of this, right, the result of this view, is that all statements of aesthetics and then ultimately all statements of value wind up working like this. So if you and I disagree about the quality of something, whether it's a work of art, uh, whether that is, say, a meal, whatever, if, good example, actually. This is actually an issue that I, as a philosopher, naturally, and a parent of young children, that I try to fix and correct with the way that my kids talk about things, right? Kids have this tendency to attribute universal qualities to stuff, probably more than they ought to. So if there is a particular food that one of my kids doesn't like, my oldest, Sersha, she doesn't like raw carrots. Neither do I. Cooked carrots are fine. Great, whatever. Raw carrots, neither of us really care for them. But when I say, hey, do you want a carrot? And she says, no, that's disgusting. I have to say, well, wait a minute, hold on. Are you sure about that? Because I know there's a lot of people who do like raw carrots. 
and that there's stuff to like about them. It's just, you know, we don't, we don't really like them. And so she's like, oh, okay, yeah. I don't like raw carrots. Can you cook them for me? Or can we have some other snack or something like that? Right? And there's a really important difference there. Again, thinking back to when we were talking about, um, talking about opinions versus preferences, right? Thinking to my, my chocolate versus vanilla ice cream example. I might prefer vanilla ice cream over chocolate, but I don't think it's better. Right? If I am actually saying that it's better, then I'm saying something about the ice cream itself. If I'm saying that this is a delicious meal, but I'm full, no thank you, that isn't me saying, I d that isn't even me saying that, it's, that I don't like it. It's certainly not me saying it's bad. The reason that I can say those two things, right, this is a delicious meal, but no thank you, is because we recognize this difference between attributing qualities to the thing itself and attributing qualities to ourselves in relation to the thing. Right. And so the emotivist view is reducing all of these value statements, especially aesthetic judgments, but we'll move on to moral judgments where this gets even more troubling. But reducing all of these kinds of statements to merely being statements about the speaker. Right? When I say, for example, this is a delicious meal, it means I want it. Which is obviously not the case. Whoops. Interesting. Um, right, that's obviously not the case because there are, like I said, there are plenty of circumstances under which you might think that something is good but not want it, and vice versa. Think uh, you might want something but know that it's not, it's not particularly the best thing either right now or in general. Right. Again, take my take my ice cream example. I really like vanilla ice cream. Chocolate's better, but I don't like it. All right. With me so far? OK. All right. So skipping ahead a ways, because he does this, this hermeneutic thing, and he comes back to this idea a few times. Some of the other points that he makes about this, this little bit in particular, which is one of the central points of this chapter, is when we make not just aesthetic statements, but any statements of value, they can be debunked or reduced like this. Right. So if we take, for example, here we go. Um, these examples that he gives, when he's talking about the, uh, the, the, the advertisement for the pleasure cruise, where, uh, where Gaius and Titius are debunking this ad for a cruise that is talking about how all the adventures you'll go on and, and uh, you will sail where Drake of Devon did and all that stuff, right? Um, guys and Titius point out, well, you're not really gonna go on adventures, it's a cruise, right? It's not really going to where Drake sailed, right? You're not, you're not you know, circumnavigating the globe. None of this is really what we're talking about. It's, it's all just kind of an ad, right? They're just trying to sell it up. OK, great. Who cares? That's relevant to literature. What they are doing here is saying that these sorts of local associations or these kinds of, uh, these kinds of emotional appeals, broadly speaking, are irrelevant to how we should place value on things. And so Lewis brings up these other examples, right? The examples of uh, from Johnson and Wordsworth talking about um, the this quote here, which I'll just read it from the book if I can find it. Um, That man is little to be envied whose patriotism would not gain force upon the plain of Marathon or whose piety would not grow warmer among the ruins of Iona. So this is basically just referring to these, uh, these ancient sites in, in the Greek world primarily that should bring us a kind of appreciation for these great events of the past and should inspire in us 
certain feelings that are relevant to our present and our lives and our, even our development of virtue. But the same argument could be applied to this that we get applied to the, the cruise advertisement. Well, yeah, fine. What does a particular location where a battle happened over 2,000 years ago have anything to do with patriotism? It's not even my country. Why should I care? Right? You could say that. But Lewis's point is that by doing that, you are, first of all, Well, first of all, you're not talking about English. You're not talking about the actual composition of the piece, which that's a side note. But more importantly, you are dismissing a particular sentiment on the basis of it being a sentiment rather than on the basis of what it tells you and why. You're training yourself to cast away these these emotional associations with things without considering what they are and what they're associated with. Right. So the, the great example I have of this is this one. The, uh, what he refers to as the trousered ape or the urban blockhead. Do you remember these examples? So what, do you remember what they were? He talks about the trousered ape who can't conceive of something and the, the urban blockhead who thinks of something as something. No? Yeah. Colorful examples that I really, care, that I really like. So the, uh, when he's referring to the trousered ape, uh, he's saying, well, um, that the, the student that Gaius and Titius are making, that the emotivist will produce, is someone who cannot conceive of the Atlantic Ocean as anything more than so many million tons of cold salt water. In other words, somebody who is simply reducing the thing down to its meaningless constituent parts. Essentially, you're just being pedantic. You're being reductionist. You're not seeing the whole because you're caught up thinking, you're, you're reducing it down to its little parts. Missing the forest for the trees. Right? How many more cliches I can say, I don't know. But the other example he gives is the urban blockhead who, uh, who sees horses as nothing more than an old-fashioned bicycle. Right? You don't see the horse as a creature in its own right. You just see it for its utility because that's how I relate to it and that's all that really matters. Right? Right? So it might be that you just see the, the horse as an old-fashioned bicycle. Fine. You might also, well, no, okay, context-wise, the reason that he brings this up is in the other author he talks about, Orbilius, is sort of dismissing this idea that horses have, um, are analogized as having uh, an interest in the colonization of the, uh, of the colonists of Australia, I think it was, right? Which, no, okay, fine, it was poorly written and because it doesn't actually appeal to that, it doesn't appeal to anything real, but the idea that the student should not overly anthropomorphize animals, and so therefore should simply think of animals in terms of their utility, is overly reducing things down. You're missing out on the reality of what you're dealing with by trying to pick it apart too much. My favorite modern parallel example of this is Neil deGrasse Tyson, the, um, the sort of science popularizer. Come on, here we go. Who has this rather silly tradition of every New Year's, fine. Every New Year's, uh, he, there it is, here we go. He tweets basically the same thing. And uh, he did this this year as well. This is an outdated version of it. But he's done basically this, the same thing, for like 10 years now. Um, not that anybody's asked, but New Year's Day on the Gregorian calendar is a cosmically arbitrary event carrying no astronomical significance at all. To those who reckon time on the Gregorian calendar, happy New Year. But, uh, but January 1st is astronomically insignificant. And he does this literally every January 1st. It's almost a meaningful tradition at this point, ironically. But why I bring attention to this example in particular is this is precisely the kind of thing that 
Lewis is criticizing for, uh, that Lewis is criticizing, say, Gaius and Titius and Orbilius for, it is this kind of reductionism. It is missing the meaningful significance of something by trying to reduce it down to little constituent parts that are themselves individually meaningless. In other words, what he's doing here is he's saying that I have a particular field of inquiry that is astronomy, cosmology if you, even. And given that this particular date, reckoned by a particular calendar, is not particularly significant in that context, I'm going to assume that it's not significant in any context, which is silly, right? There's a reason we can kind of laugh at this, and kind of make fun of this. And the reason, of course, is that, is that be, just because something does not have a particular kind of significance doesn't mean it doesn't have any significance. Again, so just because the Atlantic Ocean doesn't have the particular significance of, say, its composition, and you're just saying, well, it's a bunch of salt water, who cares, right? That doesn't mean that the thing as a whole loses significance. We should be able to attribute some manner of significance to things in themselves as they are rather than uh, under only one particular way of looking at them. We should, look, we should be able to look at things holistically. Now, okay. why we're reading this in an ethics class is that when you extend this treatment of value statements, right, aesthetic judgments, things like that, when you extend this to statements of moral value, things up here, things like political statements, or virtue statements, or um, statements about traditional values, things like that. When you say that it is a sweet and seemly thing to die for one's country is merely a sentiment. It is merely a description of how you feel about the possibility of death and how others might feel about it later, and that those are ultimately insignificant because that's only describing how you or somebody else might feel about something Suddenly, what we are in the practice of doing is completely, what we're at least trying, to debunk the notion of ethics itself. Right. By reducing ethics to simply what I or you or somebody else might think or feel about something, we're implying that there is nothing objective about it. We're implying that there is nothing significant about it. Just like there might be nothing significant about January 1st, from a cosmological or astronomical perspective. Okay. With me so far? All right. So rather, what's the alternative? Because he proposes a bit of an alternative view, which is what? How should we instead think of statements of value, think of aesthetic judgments, moral judgments, that sort of thing? If you recall, this is where he talks about what he calls the Tao or the Tao, if you will, if you'd rather pronounce it, pronounce it that way, T-A-O. So he takes the name Tao from, uh, from a particular aspect of Chinese philosophy, from Taoism, um, but he doesn't want to limit it to that perspective in general. Part of what he's going to do in chapter two is try, try and draw a sort of through line uh, through a bunch of different philosophical traditions from around the world that makes similar points about objective value statements, right? And so he's using the name the Tao to sort of draw our attention to this commonality, this idea of uh, what he calls the doctrine of objective value. And so uh, I'm gonna quote something uh, a bit lengthy, and this is, if you have the hard copy, this is from 18 and 19. Um, 19, I guess. No, no, 18, 19. He says, it is the doctrine of objective value, the belief that certain attitudes are really true and others really false 
to the kind of things the universe is and the kind of things we are. Okay, so pause there. He's saying that these statements of value, even aesthetic judgments, judgments about sublimity, prettiness, etc., are actually statements about the world itself, and that moral or ethical statements are objective statements about the kinds of things that we are, about what we are as human beings. And that that is more or less invariable. That when I say I ought to do this or I ought to do that, I'm saying something real, not just here's what I want to do. Right. Okay, so continuing on, he says, those who know the Tao can hold that to call children delightful or old men venerable is not simply to record a psychological fact about our own parental or filial emotions at the moment, but to recognize a quality which demands a certain response from us, whether we make it or not. What's his point? What's he getting at here? What's he's trying to say? What is his example, and what is it pointing to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you put it that way, right? Because it's not that it isn't about the emotional response you have. It's as you said, that there's more to it than that. Yes, the emotional response is still important, essential. It really does tell us things. But that's not all. That's not all there is to the discussion. So I'll, I'll continue here and we'll maybe put this into context. So he says, I myself do not enjoy the company of small children. So Lewis doesn't like kids, which is weird for someone who's known as a children's author, but whatever. Um, he says, because I speak from within the Tao, I recognize this as a defect in myself, just as a man may have to recognize that he is tone deaf or colorblind. And because our approvals and disapprovals are thus recognitions of objective value or responses to an objective order, therefore emotional states, uh, sorry, therefore emotional states can be in harmony with reason when we feel liking for what ought to be approved, or, or out of harmony with reason, when we perceive that liking is due but cannot feel it. So, yes, we have emotional judgments about things. We have emotional states about things, right? You might think that the waterfall is sublime, or you might think that the waterfall is pretty. You might think that the children running and screaming around the restaurant is delightful. You might think that the, running, the children running and screaming around the restaurant is annoying. One or the other of those, in either case, can be a more correct emotional response than the other. Right? That's his point. That our emotional responses to things are analogous to our sense perceptions, is a way of thinking about it. So if you see, I have a marker over here, um, if you, for example, see, I don't know, this, And you happen to be red, green, colorblind. And you happen to be innumerate. You might think that that is an upside down red H. See what I'm getting at, right? So if you cannot tell, if, if because there's something wrong with your eyes or your optic nerves, you cannot tell the difference between red and green. You might have guessed that, that is red. And because you don't know what numbers are, you think it's an H, a lowercase h just flipped upside down for some reason. Okay, so this speaks to a couple of different things. There might be something wrong simply with your sense apparatus, right? Your, your eyes and your optic nerves might not be functioning properly, and so you can't distinguish between things like you should be able to. Or you might just have insufficient information to make a proper judgment. You don't know what a four is, and so the closest thing you can, your mind can come up with is H flipped. Okay. Now, that isn't completely wrong, but it's still wrong, right? Just like our waterfall example, right? The tourist who calls it pretty isn't like completely wrong. It's just an insufficient description of the thing. It's missing something. Like, yeah, that could kind of be an upside down H, but 
it's a four. Right? And so emotional reactions to things work in this similar way to sense perception because you could have an emotional reaction to something. But that emotional reaction could be wrong. You could have the wrong or at least not quite the correct emotional response to something. Suppose, for example, um, this actually happens once in a while. It's very rare, thankfully, but uh, it happens more in other buildings. Uh, suppose a bird were to just fly into the window, crash, and die. It doesn't happen in this building, thankfully, very much. But there are some buildings where this is just notorious, just based on how they're built. Right? Birds just don't see the window and just smash into the thing, fall to the ground, and die. Suppose your immediate emotional reaction to that were humor. Because, to be fair, there is something abstractly funny about it because of the incongruity. We don't expect that sort of thing. And so, <laughs> might be a kind of response to it. But I think we should be able to recognize that's not the correct response, right? The correct emotional response to something like that would be something like pity. Right? That, oh, that poor thing, that's, that's terrible, that's unfortunate. It's a shame that happened. Right? Now, that emotional response can tell us something, like maybe we should design buildings better so that they aren't luring birds to their deaths. There are, by the way, some buildings that just get piles of birds near them just because of how they're laid out. It's kind of, it's a known problem in modern architecture. Um, there is a, there's a building where I, where I have taught down on, on USF's campus where throughout the semester, um, I think it was like three different times during class that happened what gives me this idea for this example. Right. So this does happen, right? It could happen. And, and having that sort of negative emotional response to it can tell you, hmm, this is something that's not very good. And this is something that maybe we should do something about it. So in other words, this emotional response can give us information if it's the correct one. However, if it's the incorrect emotional response, if your immediate response to it is, <laughs> that's funny, then maybe what we should do is we should set up a camera outside and just post these birdie snuff films on the internet so more people can chuckle about them. Except, no, we probably shouldn't do that, right? The reason we're able to recognize that our immediate emotional response to something is the wrong response is because we can recognize what kind of situation something is and therefore what kind of reaction it merits, right? Something bad happens, if your immediate response is that's funny, you recognize that there's something wrong with you in some sense. Just like if you recognize that as being red, you can recognize that there's something wrong with your perceptive apparatus, noticing that, well, wait, I maybe can't distinguish between colors. So this is, broadly speaking, the alternative perspective that Lewis is going to be exploring in the next couple of chapters, right? He's going to be looking at how we can perceive things and how we can understand things and even how we can have emotional responses to things and what that can tell us knowing that something is objectively a certain way. And so it's not dismissing emotion. But it's not exclusively listening to emotion either. It is harmonizing our emotional reactions with our reason, right? And this is his, um, the, where is the little illustration here? Ah, this bit here. Hence the title of the chapter, Men Without Chests. The idea here, this comes from Plato, is that we, largely speaking, our souls have three parts. We have the mind, we have the appetites, and we have passion. The mind, the head, the appetites, the belly, and the chest, right, which stands for passion, emotional responses, that that needs to be aligned with reason so that it can control the appetites because otherwise the appetites are going to go crazy and that's what's going to ultimately lead us. So if we don't have this, this well-ordered emotional responses to things, that's going to be uh, what's going to lead us astray. If we don't have that uh, that emotional core that is going to enforce the dictates of reason, we're going to wander off into nonsense land, which is kind of what the third chapter is about.